the world again. So, uh, good morning or good afternoon or good night <laughs> to all of you. Well, today we will I will talk about the parabolic draft technology, which is uh, probably the best known CSP technology, since uh, we have uh, several operating plans since uh, many years ago. So <coughs> we will uh, we, we will. Uh, talk during this uh, session on this uh, technology. We will talk about uh, Renal te technology probably next day because uh, the, the time is perhaps too short for, for this. So, <coughs> well, let's start with, uh, with uh, the parabolic draft technology. <coughs> uh, <just coughs> in the first session we saw that there are uh, four main concentrating technology, four main CSP technologies. These technologies are parabolic troughs and linear Fresnel reflector, with, uh, which uh, concentrate on one <coughs> line, line focus, uh, while uh, central receivers, central receivers, and uh, and uh, parabolic dishes concentrate on point focus. So <clears throat> we will talk today about parabolic traf uh, line focus technology, concentration two dimensions, and uh, <clears throat> because of this characteristic we uh, cannot achieve with this, te this technology a very high concentration. The concentration, as we saw last day, will be in the range of the tens of uh, <coughs> tensors. Uh, from uh, maybe 20 to 80, 90 suns. This is the, the characteristic range uh, of concentration for parabolic traps. Here we can see some pictures of uh, <coughs> different uh, of two solar power plants. Uh, <coughs> well, in fact, more than two, because uh, in this picture we s we can see at least three different plants in the Mojave Desert in the United States, and this is another plant in the, <coughs> the Nevada Desert, also well near Las Vegas in Nevada and United States. And we can see some uh, closer pictures of uh, the collector, what we call a collector, which uh, is uh, the <coughs> main component of these parabolic traps. The collector is uh, made of a reflector, of, as we will see immediately, and uh, a receiver tube. This is the receiver tube, and here you can see the reflector, the concentrator itself. Well, um, parabolic draft solar thermal power plants uh, follow the same general configuration, the same basic configuration that uh, I tried to explain last day. Uh, the basic configuration of uh, one solar thermal power plant is made of a concentrator that concentrates the sunlight, the beam component of the solar radiation, on the surface of a receiver, or well, on a receiver, because it can be also a volumetric receiver, but it concentrates the, <coughs> the beam component on the receiver, the absorber. Uh, here, the absorber of the receiver, the concentrated sunlight is converted to thermal energy. This thermal energy is can be used can be used to drive uh, to drive uh, a thermal thermal engine, some kind of thermal energy of thermal engine that uh, converts thermal energy into work. To mechanical work into electricity. Uh, in these two plants, we can also find some uh, other main, two other main blocks, uh, like the thermal storage, thermal energy storage, which uh, can store part or all of the thermal energy produced after at the receiver, uh, and store it so that uh, it can be used later in the day or a few hours later or it can be used during uh, transients or periods with a uh, low solar radiation. And we can also have an auxiliary boiler or an hybridization system, more generally speaking, which uh, 
it's um, a second a second uh, thermal energy source it can be driven by a fossil fuel or biomass or any fuel in general and uh, this can be a complement of the <coughs> of the thermal energy produced at the, at the solar system In this picture, we can see uh, the configuration of a parabolic trough power plant and um, <coughs> one specific parabolic trough power plant. This corresponds to the <coughs> configuration of, the, of some of the plants that are being built in Spain, like uh, Andasol, for example, which is uh, already operating. And uh, we can identify here the, the main blocks that uh, are, that uh, make up the uh, solar thermal power plant. First, we can see the solar field. The solar field. I have again problems with the pointer. I don't know why. Now, now it seems. Well, we can see the solar field. Um, and uh, in this uh, solar field, we uh, have the concentrator and the receiver, hmm? uh, as we will see immediately. So the solar field collects the solar radiation from uh, the solar, the direct component of the solar radiation and concentrates it on the receiver. At the receiver, the solar radiation is converted to thermal energy, normally uh, in the form of uh, an increase in temperature of uh, flu fluid. In this case, it's uh, thermal oil. Uh, it goes into the field at a uh, Older temperature and leaves the solar field at a higher temperature. This uh, thermal oil is uh, then used at a series of uh, heat exchangers to generate, to produce steam. This is the series of heat exchangers. We can see some of them here some uh, preheaters, steam generators superheaters and even a reheater in this case uh, sorry in a reheater and uh, <coughs> well the superheated steam is driven to steam turbine where it generates uh, electricity if uh, we have excess of uh, thermal energy from the field or uh, our operating strategy uh, is uh, designed to do so, we can send part of the thermal energy delivered by the solar field to storage system, thermal storage system. We will not uh, go in depth about uh, thermal storage because it will be, uh, be treated in another session, but uh, in this case it's a thermal storage based on two tanks with uh, molten salts, a cold tank and a hot tank. <coughs> uh, so we can charge the storage system from the solar field and uh, whenever we wish to make use of this stored energy we just operate it reverse using these valves so that uh, we can heat up the, the oil and again use the oil for example for uh, generating steam. Finally, in this uh, scheme, in this uh, diagram, we can also identify an auxiliary uh, boiler. Auxiliary boiler. In this case, it, this boiler uses natural gas, and this boiler, in this configuration, is used to heat the the oil. Uh, again, once you have the oil heated, you can use it to generate steam or even to charge the thermal storage if necessary. Well, we will now uh, go, we will now describe uh, with uh, some uh, detail, perhaps not too much because we don't have a lot of time, but with some details the components of a parabolic trough power plant. The main element of the of parabolic trough power plant is the collector, what it's normally called the collector. The collector is a concentrator, it's a concentrator and uh, with, a, with a receiver placed 
at the focus, at this uh, line focus. We, we have two types of uh, parabolic trap collectors. One of them, the most popular perhaps, is the one with, um, uh, with one only axis of rotation. This is the one that you normally see in these all plants. The other one has uh, two axis tracking. Uh, this is a model that was designed by a German company, by the German company MAN in the MAN, the 80s. Uh, this is a picture of uh, the remainings of uh, the solar field at the Plataforma Solar de Almería with uh, these types of collectors. At the moment, uh, <coughs> the one-axis tracking collectors have been more successful. Um, most, uh, I would say, all uh, parabolic traffic plants use one-axis tracking collectors because of uh, more simplicity and uh, on the other hand with a two axis tracking you don't get special advantages in this case <clears throat> here you can see a picture of a collector the same that we saw in the first slide uh, where we can see mirrors mirrors that uh, make up the reflector or the concentrator and the are the mirrors and the receiver tube receiver tubes placed on the focus of the parabola because uh, these parabolic traps are parabolic concentrators uh, <coughs> they have a parabolic section in one of their dimensions the main elements of the collector are the reflector itself the mirror the receiver tube we have already seen pictures of both of them and have already mentioned them. But we also need a structure, a space frame or any other kind of a structure to support the reflector, the concentrator and the receiver tube. A tracking system, since uh, all concentrating systems must track the sun uh, somehow, or this type, at least this type of concentrating system, these are imaging concentrating system they have to track the sun in this case it's a one axis tracking as i commented before and we also have some connecting connecting elements and control system and other auxiliary equipment but the main components <coughs> are described here <coughs> the applications of the of the parabolic trough collectors are different applications they can go from process heat where you don't need very high temperatures so you don't need high concentrations and uh, you can use uh, concentrators or collectors of relatively small size like these ones that you can see in this picture and you can also you can even use uh, chip mirrors normally because you don't have the need for very high temperatures <coughs> When you go to solar thermal power plants, uh, you have to use uh, high concentration collectors. Uh, they have a large aperture like this that you can see here. You can compare the size of the concentrator with the size of the people uh, that are walking in this uh, field. <coughs> and uh, normally they, uh, well, they have a very high reflectivity the the mirrors are are high reflectivity mirrors the tubes as we will see the absorber or the receiver tubes as we will see immediately are quite special receiver tubes etc so the, uh, we have different applications and different uh, technology for these applications normally for solar thermal power plants we will use large Large aperture concentrators, large aperture collectors. If we talk about the mirrors, we are talking about the mirrors. Uh, we have the first thing I have to say is that uh, these mirrors are uh, normal mirrors, I would say. In what sense? In the sense that they are made of, uh, of uh, glass and uh, reflective uh, surface 
normally made of uh, silver, like the mirrors of our cars or of our, of our homes. The only uh, <coughs> factor which, which is different from these commercial or these uh, everyday life mi uh, mirrors is that they have to have low content in iron to avoid the absorption of uh, part of solar radiation in the wavelengths wavelengths corres corresponding to the to the iron to the to the iron presence in the mirror so they are uh, just glass mirrors with low content in iron we can <coughs> we can see two different types of uh, mirrors for for high temperature applications the first one is the thin the thick glass mirrors they uh, here the glass has a thickness of uh, between 3 and 5 millimeters normally and uh, <coughs> they these mirrors uh, are curved uh, at the factory factory so uh, they have to be curved at the factory because they have a rather large uh, high curvature and uh, <coughs> they can be made of uh, tempered or floated uh, glass depending there are different manufacturers and uh, they have uh, structural properties so that they can be fixed to the supporting structure di directly as we can see sample here uh, until uh, two or three years ago there was one only manufacturer of uh, these types of mirrors it was the german company uh, <coughs> flavic um, but uh, since uh, since the since the takeoff of the csp business especially in spain some other companies of the sector of the mirrors the glass in general have entered into this market and now there are at least two other competitors for for flavor like uh, rio glass in spain or uh, la veneciana from the saint Coven group in portugal probably there are, there are more uh, these mirrors are relatively expensive because uh, well, one of the reasons if, is that they are low iron content glass but the other reason is that the, there was not much uh, competence between manufacturers there were there are not many manufacturers at the moment and the demand is uh, probably still higher than the offer the other type of uh, mirrors are the thin glass mirrors in this case we have a glass a thin glass of uh, a few few tenths of a millimeter uh, thickness and these thin glass mirrors can be can be glued to a surface to a supporting surface that uh, gives the mirror the shape of the concentrator and these mirrors are interesting uh, because they have a high reflectivity they are probably cheaper and the structures can be made cheaper but on the other hand they are more complex and are subject to to other problems like uh, corrosion if the if the if the glass is not properly glued to the to the supporting structure and other problems so at the moment for parabolic trough power plants most uh, i would say all all of the <coughs> mirrors that are being used in these plants are thick glass mirrors like the ones we can see here there are however another or well, some other alternatives to these types of mirrors at the moment they have not uh, become completely commercial although they are announced like uh, commercial at the moment you can find the information on uh, on both of the on this uh, for example on these two alternatives i'm presenting here on the web these alternatives are uh, reflective films made of uh, polymers like uh, the reflective films manufactured by reflect or 3m 
they have a well for example 3m has uh, had this uh, reflective film for a long time it's a high reflectivity film with uh, the very good uh, reflectivity and very good optical characteristics but uh, up to now the main problem has been the <coughs> durability uh, because uh, it's very sensitive to to the environmental conditions and the lifetime at the moment was not was not sufficient for these applications the manufacturers claim that uh, they are getting a much better lifetime for their products so we will probably see in the next future some uh, collectors with this uh, reflective surface for example we can see here one uh, collector made by the company sky fuel you can also find information of it in the web uh, which is being tested uh, if i'm not wrong at sandia national labs in the united states another alternative is to use high reflectivity aluminum aluminum sorry it's an error aluminum surfaces uh, like the ones manufactured by Alanov. we have similar <coughs> similar problems to with this uh, reflecting surface as we have with uh, reflective films they have uh, an excellent reflectivity excellent optical characteristics however uh, they have to demonstrate that their lifetime is comparable to the lifetime of um, of the thick glass mirrors which has which are at the moment the state of the art <coughs> the mirrors have to be supported by a supporting structure there are different types of supporting structure if we concentrate on the types normally used for uh, the, co the collectors of solar thermal power plants we can see here some of the different models that are available today first this one is the LS3 model uh, which uh, was designed by the company Luz which was the company that uh, <coughs> that uh, erected the sex plant in the Mojave Desert in the Mojave Desert in the United States states in the 80s and 90s of the last century uh, this is a uh, 5.7 meters of aperture. The aperture is the is this dimension from from one from top top to down is uh, in this picture. That's the aperture. We will see later uh, another explanation. We will, this. Um, uh, well, as I said, this is a 5.7 uh, meter aperture collector, originally 100 meters long. Uh, that means that uh, 100 meters of uh, of mirrors can be moved can be moved by a single uh, engine or <coughs> or drive by a single drive. Uh, from uh, this uh, from this uh, model there have been several uh, evolutions all most of them have the same dimension like the ones we can see here for example this is the Eurotraf model developed uh, by a consortium of uh, European companies and um, and R&D institutions uh, <coughs> under the, with funding of the European Commission this uh, Eurotraf, um, Eurotraf uh, collector has what is called a torque box uh, design. It's this uh, box, made, uh, this space frame box that you can see uh, here in this, where I'm pointing now in the picture. And another another model is the, this one based on a torque uh, tube. In this case, this is the center trough model designed and uh, manufactured by a company the Spanish company Sener there are a few others with similar dimensions and there is also uh, at least I know another in the 
<coughs> in commercial solar thermal power plants is the I think it's the model DS2. Uh, it's uh, manufactured by Solargenics or Axione, and it's a bit smaller. It's only five meters in aperture, and the space frame is made of aluminium uh, pieces. Well, uh, the the mission of the the function of the space frame is to keep the concentrator shape, uh, <clears throat> avoiding uh, avoiding deformations as much as possible, so that the reflected ray is always focused on the receiver tube, which is plain on the on the focus of the parabola. The receiver tube is the uh, <coughs> is perhaps the most uh, it's one of the most uh, um, complicated elements of this uh, technology. Basically, receiver tube is just a tube uh, with a blackened surface so that uh, it absorbs most of the solar radiation that uh, is focused on, on it. But, uh, well, the evolution of uh, these receiver tubes uh, has been marked by the design of uh, the company Luz for the sex plants. They designed this sophisticated tube, which consists of a steel tube with a selective uh, <coughs> with a selective surface treatment that uh, maximizes the absorption of solar radiation and minimizes the emission of infrared radiation so that the efficiency of the absorption of the absorber tube is uh, very high. This selective coating has to be protected from the environment because it operates at uh, quite high temperatures and uh, <coughs> to protect it from the environment it's covered by uh, another glass tube. And uh, now that we have uh, this steel tube and a glass tube, the idea was to make a vacuum between both tubes so that uh, the protection of the selective surface is uh, best and also uh, we minimize the convection vacuum losses. The problem is that uh, you have to keep the vacuum between both tubes if you wish to make this tube operate efficiently and to do this you have to have a, a leak-proof uh, glass metal union. Uh, this is a complicated technology because uh, glass and, and steel have normally different uh, expansion coefficients so uh, it's not easy to design or to manufacture a tube like this. In this, uh, in this uh, diagram we can also see some other elements like these getters for vacuum maintenance because uh, during the operation of uh, parabolic trough plants, especially with those which operate with uh, thermal oil, as we will say immediately, <coughs> um, there are some leaks of hydrogen from hydrogen generated by the composition, the composition of the thermal oil to the space between both tubes. These uh, getters absorb part of the absorb this uh, hydrogen, keeping the vacuum in this space, and can also uh, act as indicators of a correct vacuum. We also have, depending on the design, different uh, well, different ways to to absorb the different uh, expansion of uh, the glass and the metal tube. For example, in this case, it's an expansion below. <coughs> well, um, as I said, this is a design of the company Luz. For many years, there have there have been only one manufacturer. Uh, it was the Israeli company Solel, which, uh, as far as I know, is now owned by Siemens. And uh, since a uh, few years ago, Schott, a German company, designed their own tubes and are being very successful in the market too.
here we can see pictures of the shot tube uh, and uh, pictures of the last models of the Solel tube, the UVEC 2 and UVEC 3. As you can see, the design is slightly different, but uh, the principle is the same. It's a steel tube with selective coating and, uh, <coughs> and a glass tube and envelope, glass tube, uh, <coughs> which uh, has to have a very low reflectivity and very high transmissivity and uh, with vacuum between these tubes. It's basically the same. Now we go to the thermal, to the heat transfer fluid. Uh, there have been different uh, different heat, heat transfer fluid uh, <coughs> during the history of parabolic traffic plants. Oil has been has been traditionally the one preferred for high temperatures applications. For example, in the first of the sex plants in the, in California, uh, <coughs> they used the Caloria HT oil, which is a mineral oil which uh, has to operate, which operates at temperatures up to 300 degrees C. When there was a need for higher temperatures, higher temperatures are related with higher efficiencies. Uh, they moved at the sex plants to a different to different oils like the Therminol VP1 oil. This is a uh, this is a synthetic oil which uh, is can be can operate uh, without degradation at temperatures up to 400 degrees C. So this is more or less the limit of a uh, rating temperature for this uh, parabolic trap power plants, thermal power plants, with uh, which use H, uh, thermal oil as uh, heat transfer fluid. This is currently the state of the art. Not only the nine sex plants, but also the plant that uh, Axiona uh, built in near Las Vegas in, in, two, in 2007, and uh, the plants that uh, have been built and are being built in Spain use this uh, type of oil. So they operate normally with a temperature limit of 400 degrees C. There are, another, there are other thermal oils like uh, Siltherm, with this, which is a uh, synthetic silicone, uh, silicone yes, um, which can operate at uh, higher temperatures, but they are also more expensive. So at the moment, they have not been widely used for solar thermal power plants. Perhaps for specific applications, uh, it's uh, <coughs> they have uh, there have been some there have been some uh, experiences. <coughs> so uh, thermal oil as uh, heat transfer fluid is currently the state of the art, but uh, thermal oil, especially the Terminal VP1 and similar similar oils have uh, some problems. Uh, of course, the main problem is that they cannot operate at temperatures higher than uh, 400 degrees C. Another problem is the cost. It's relatively expensive, not as much as uh, the Siltherm oil, but uh, still expensive. And uh, finally, in case of uh, leaks, they are pollutants and uh, even uh, because they operate they are at very high temperatures, uh, they can burn, they can emit a fire. So there are some environmental concerns about the use of this oil. And uh, on the other hand, um, this, uh, you need, you use this uh, oil, the solar field, you need heat exchangers to generate steam. Heat exchangers, if you have a molten salt, uh, thermal storage, so uh, there are a lot of efforts, efforts to identify other heat transfer fluids that can be used at parabolic trap thermal power plants. Uh, the main, perhaps the most promising one is water. It's the direct uh, generation of steam in the solar field. Um, 
with water you don't have the temperature limit you can operate at temperatures higher than 400 degrees C that's an advantage from the point of view of the power of the power block of the steam turbine you can operate at higher temperature you can achieve higher efficiencies uh, the, <coughs> there were some concerns about the controllability of this process but uh, there was a very successful experiment at uh, PSA, Plataforma Solar de Almería, in Spain, and they demonstrated that uh, there are different ways to operate um, parabolic thermal power plants with, with uh, water, steam, as HTF, as heat transfer fluid. And currently, there, there, is, uh, <coughs> there are plans to build a pilot pilot commercial parabolic draft thermal power plant with uh, direct steam generation in, in Ciudad Real, in Puerto Llano. Uh, it's more or less uh, uh, center of Spain, central Spain. And uh, this, this, power, this uh, direct steam generation parabolic draft thermal power plant will have a power of uh, Three megawatts, if, uh, if I'm not wrong. And the plant will probably be built uh, uh, next year or so. Another option is to use molten salts at uh, the solar field as HTF. Molten salts are mixtures of uh, of. Uh, sodium and uh, potassium nitrates and uh, they have a well they have a melting point that depends on the composition uh, molten salts are an excellent uh, thermal fluid have a high thermal capacity and uh, and uh, from point of view of the, the of the management of uh, these uh, molten salts, uh, its uh, viscosity is quite good and can be managed quite well. The main problem with molten salts is that the melting point or the freezing point is uh, quite high, and you have to make sure you have to make sure that uh, that uh, the molten salts never get freezed of the tubes on the uh, valves, on the pumps, on the components of the of the salt system, molten salt system, because other way other way you get in trouble. To avoid the freezing, uh, there are different ways. Um, <coughs> currently, there are works. There's a pilot plant in Italy, in Sicily. It's the Archimedes project uh, managed by Inea. And uh, they have a molten salt plant plant uh, in operation there, uh, or it has been it has been put recently in operation. We will see the results, but uh, for the success of this technology, uh, there are different ways. Probably one of them is to is to identify uh, molten salt uh, mixtures. With a lower freezing point, other is to develop uh, components that are less sensitive to the freezing of salts, and uh, finally, uh, most of the way is to heat up all the components of the system to avoid freezing. Um, in any case, this uh, last solution leads to high parasitic consumption, and uh, so to less decreased efficiency. There are investigations with uh, other fluids like gases. For example, at the uh, Plataforma Sor de Almería, there's a research facility that it's being operated with CO2 as working fluid. Uh, from my point of view, it's a difficult uh, technology because uh, it has to operate a very high pressure to be efficient. Gases are normally not very good uh, heat transfer fluid, but uh, well, uh, we have to wait for the for the results. 
In any case, as I, as I <coughs> stress here, the state of the art at the moment is the use of uh, oils, of uh, thermal oils, as uh, heat transfer fluid at these types of uh, plants. So, well, we have to have also tracking mechanisms different types of uh, mechanism for example for small collectors you can use electrical motors and gearboxes uh, but uh, for the large collectors which are used in solar thermal power plants you normally use hydraulic drives uh, <coughs> these hydraulic drives these hydraulic drives provide the mechanical power necessary to move one collector. Other elements which are important are, for example, the, the, the elements to connect collectors. A solar field is made up of uh, many collectors connected between them and uh, in some cases you can have different movements in one collector from the neighboring one. So you need uh, <coughs> connections that allow for different displacement of uh, to, to collectors. Traditionally, flex hoses, flexible hoses have been used. Uh, they showed some problems during the operation of the sex plants and they were progressively replaced by ball joints that uh, we can see here some connections made made with uh, ball joints see here these connections which uh, have proven to be more safe but uh, in any case there's uh, some concern about some concern about the the operation of these uh, ball joints at uh, high temperatures for a long time so some companies some industries are looking for different solutions, perhaps, perhaps combining uh, the best of the two solutions. <coughs> the collector is the main element of a, of a solar thermal power plant with this technology, with parabolic traps. The, the collectors have to be connected between them. A collector is normally made of a set of modules or solar collecting elements. Solar collecting elements, element, for example, in most of the collectors I mentioned before, in the Eurotraf LS3 or Center Traf, uh, is 14 meters in length, and uh, <coughs> and um, in one collector you have a set, for example in this case, 12 uh, solar co uh, collecting elements connecting, connected rigidly between them. The tubes, the tubes are normally 4 meters in, in length from factory and they are welded in this length and uh, all the collectors, these uh, 12 solar collecting elements connected between them, are supported in a set of pylons and moved by a single, by a single uh, drive, by a single hydraulic drive. <coughs> then the collectors are connected, are connected in loops. We can see here one loop, for example. This loop is made of four collectors, 150 meters in length each. These uh, loops are connected to the to the main oil collectors, uh, it's a different uh, word in this case. Uh, it's a collector for pipelines. It's connected to the to the main uh, pipelines of cold oil. The cold oil goes into the collector, into the loop, and is heated during his uh, transit through the collector. And the the heat, the hot oil is collected in the hot pipeline. These um, pipelines are connected 
are connected to the uh, <coughs> are the main elements that distribute and collect the oil from the field. Sorry. Uh, there's something which is not working here, but uh, well, this is supposed to be uh, <coughs> a block diagram, a diagram of uh, six solar power plant, uh, an 80 megawatt solar uh, six uh, solar solar power plant, uh, which is made of uh, the solar field is made of uh, a set of um, different uh, subfields it's a uh, well i can show you here because it's not being shown on the screen but uh, these uh, subfields are connected by the pipelines but these uh, main pipelines that distribute the cold oil and collect the whole oil from the hot oil from the from the field here you can have an idea of the dimensions of this type of plants this is an 80 megawatt plant and it occupies a land surface of uh, nearly 1.4 kilometers per 1.3 kilometers. Uh, so it's a <coughs> large surface. The collectors can be connected to the main pipelines in different ways. Uh, here we have a sh we show we are showing three different ways to connect the connectors or the loops to the to the main pipelines and uh, the first one is the direct return connection which uh, is probably very efficient from the point of view of thermal losses but uh, the pressure drops are unbalanced and uh, the pumps the oil pumps have a high consumption the reverse return connection uh, has a, a, a better uh, pressure drop balance and lower consumption but the cost is higher and the thermal losses increase uh, compared to the direct return connection and finally the central connection is probably the best uh, the best option for especially for for large uh, solar fields because you have a shorter pipelines and better access to collectors Although you have an unbalanced pressure drops and you have to compensate with uh, valves and so on to, to make sure that you have the adequate mass flow at the field. <laughs> the, the loops, the loops, the collectors can be, uh, can be deployed in the field in two or in many different ways, but uh, there are two uh, extreme extreme uh, configurations or options. The first one is when you position the collectors oriented from north to south or from south to north is the same. Uh, that means that uh, the tracking is from east to west every day. And the other option is to to install them. Uh, following uh, an east-west orientation, then tracking is from uh, north to south. And uh, <coughs> well, what's the difference between these two configurations? The main difference is that uh, with uh, uh, east-west uh, tracking, the east-west tracking, you get uh, maximum yearly energy generation. Uh, but uh, with a big difference normally between between winter and summer, very high uh, generation in summer and low in winter. On the other hand, the incidence angle is never zero at noon. That means that you have also always some optical losses. This <laughs> um, one. Well, all, all of the, these uh, considerations are valid for the northern hemisphere. Southern hemisphere it would be right opposite, and for intermediate latitudes, uh, for low latitudes close to the equator, uh, probably 
uh, these uh, considerations would not be valid and uh, perhaps an east-to-west uh, duration could have a different uh, behavior, will have a different behavior. You have to analyze in the case depending on the latitude. But for intermediate latitudes like uh, Spain or southwest, uh, uh, the southwest states of the uh, United States and even North Africa, the north-south orientation with uh, east-west tracking is the one that provides maximum yearly energy generation. With the other configuration, with uh, east-west uh, orientation and north-south tracking, you get a more balanced seasonal generation uh, uh, with a maximum efficiency every day at noon because uh, the incidence angle will be zero at noon but uh, but uh, in annual terms, in yearly terms you will generate less electricity or less energy I will go fast on this, we are a little bit late uh, but uh, well, when you consider installing a collector, you normally have to look at the concentration ratio, which is the, the ratio of the receiving of the receiver surface to the collecting surface. Uh, the collecting surface is the average times the length of the collector. And the receiver surface is just the area of this uh, of the, the area of the absorber tube. Uh, the collector has to be positioned so that the sun rays are always between are always uh, within the acceptance angle. If uh, the acceptance angle is the angle that uh, makes all the rays the rays uh, hit the receiver. If uh, the sun rays are outside the, uh, the acceptance angle, then the reflected ray won't hit the receiver, and so you will have losses. Uh, of course, this depends on the dimensions of the receiver, on the characteristics of the, of the parabola, of the concentrator, and on the precision of the tracking. We'll talk a little bit about uh, the energy processes in a solar collector, in a parabolic traffic collector. First, you have the optical losses. Optical losses are mainly caused by the reflectivity of the mirrors, the <coughs> interception fac factor, which, which is the fraction of uh, sun rays that uh, hit the receiver, normally is quite high. And then the transmissivity of the glass envelope the and the absorptivity of the absorber tube. The product of uh, all these parameters is normally called the uh, peak optical efficiency for an incidence angle equal to zero. You can have also geometrical losses, mainly shadows shadows from one collector to other when the sun is low or when the collectors are too close one to the other and you can also have loss of effective collector length due to the design of the of the collector this is something that uh, can't be avoided to can be controlled but not completely avoided avoid in these types of uh, collectors and finally you have you have a uh, thermal losses mainly relative losses from the absorber tube. It's a surface at very high temperature and uh, the emitted uh, radiation depends on the on the fourth power of the temperature of the surface. And you can also have a, you also have a convection and conduction losses to the <coughs> air and to the surrounding elements. So finally you have uh, in the solar field energy balance from solar to thermal where you have to discount from the uh, energy that you <coughs> that uh, you collect the losses, the optical losses uh, which are inherent to
to the concentrator. Then the these losses are are, um, are normally quantified uh, <coughs> for an incidence angle equal to zero. When the incidence angle is not zero, then you have a to apply this uh, term, which is the incidence angle modifier that uh, quantifies the losses when the incidence angle is not zero. This incidence angle modifier is normally uh, provided by the manufacturer or, uh, and it has to be uh, determined experimentally. And finally, you have to discount the thermal losses. So, at, in the end, you have an effective heat that can be used to generate electricity a thermal engine. Well, here we can see a typical operation curve for a clear day, which uh, uh, for a clear day in a plant with no thermal storage. In this case, it's uh, from the one of the sex plant. Uh, in this day, we can see red the irradiance curve, which is, uh, shows us that it's a very good day. We have uh, more than 1,000 watts per square meters of uh, direct of beam, uh, direct normal radiation at uh, solar noon. In blue, we have the <coughs> we have the uh, thermal solar field efficiency. Uh, this is proportional to the generation of thermal energy. It's very characteristic this uh, drop noon, which is caused by the fact that uh, the field is oriented for from north to south, and then we have an incidence angle. Um, we have a greater incidence angle at noon that than some hours before or some hours later. And finally, we have the electricity generation directly from the field. We can see that we start generating electricity uh, something like uh, two hours, a bit less than two hours after the sun rises. And one hour later, more or less, we get the uh, nominal conditions, approximately. In solar thermal power plants, uh, there, there's no, no real steady state operation. Uh, there's always a dynamic that has to be followed, the dynamic of the solar radiation. And finally, when the sun goes down, the plant uh, shuts down too, as we can see here. Well, in this case, as you can see, the efficiency of, uh, of uh, the solar to electric conversion uh, was close to was close to 20% in some at some moments, always a little bit lower. Normally, in yearly terms, is uh, in the range of the fifth of 15% from solar to electricity. Finally, I will comment the commercial projects, the configuration of the commercial projects that of the plants that are nowadays operating. First, I will go to the sex type uh, plant. The sex type plant is a, is a CSP plant without thermal storage. Instead of thermal storage, there is a, an auxiliary boiler, a supplementary natural gas boiler, you can see it here, that uh, can be used uh, in this case, uh, to generate it, to generate uh, steam directly, in these sex plants are allowed to use up to 25% of uh, natural gas uh, in terms of yearly electricity production. And uh, normally, this natural gas is used at uh, peak hours when the, the generation of electricity is uh, more more uh, uh, profitable. And here you have the solar field, which is uh, similar to the ones we have uh, described here, with the uh, collectors, with the uh, LS2 or LS3 collectors. In this case, 
it would be an LS2 collector, a little bit smaller than the LS3, using, uh, using terminal VP1 as a heat transfer fluid. This uh, other diagram, which I already explained at the beginning of, uh, of this uh, session, is the diagram that corresponds to the Andasol type plants. I call them so because the first one uh, had been the Andasol one plant, which, uh, which uh, is already operating in Spain, in south of Spain, in Granada. And uh, the, difference, the main difference between this plant and the sex plant is that uh, this plant has a large thermal storage. This uh, large thermal storage which, uh, with uh, two tanks and molten salts, uh, requiring uh, a heat exchanger to charge and discharge the, the heat storage. This uh, plant is 50 megawatts in power, like most of the projects in Spain, and uh, can use up to 15% of natural gas or other fossil fuel in an auxiliary boiler or a heater in this case because it heats the oil which uh, in this case is placed on the side of the of the oil so it's used to heat up the oil instead of generating directly steam as, it, as it is the case in, in the sex types plant. I will finish a little bit later than, than uh, programmed <laughs> with a cost issue. Costs are difficult to evaluate because of, uh, there are a lot of uh, confidentiality clauses in contracts. Prices are in some cases quite volatile, like in the case of the molten salts, for example. For some elements, there are only two or three providers key elements like mirrors or absorber tubes, receiver tubes, and uh, the op operation maintenance experience is, uh, well, has been restricted, restricted to the United States, to the sex plants. Now there are a few plants, a few parabolic trough plants operating in Spain, but for uh, already for a short time, uh, probably in two or three years we will have more experience with them with uh, them and we will be able to say something something else anyway i will there to give some figures i would say for that for a uh, parabolic trough plant without thermal energy storage without thermal energy storage the cost is uh, must be approximately in the range from 3.5 to 4 euros per kilowatt hour price, I would say the price, in Spain. Uh, probably a little bit bigger, a little bit uh, higher because of the because of the the contracts, that of the type of contracts, of the EPC contracts that, that uh, are being signed in Spain, but in this range probably. And uh, this cost, approximately 60% corresponds to the solar field, that's uh, structures, mirrors, and so on. We will see it immediately. 35% to the power block. I haven't talked about the power block, but uh, for this type of plants, uh, <coughs> uh, most of uh, plants, most of projects use a turbine that is optimized for this process, uh, manufactured by Siemens. Now they are. There are also other manufacturers, but uh, most of the projects have been have been of the turbines have been provided by Siemens. And uh, again, we find the fact that there are not many not many uh, technology suppliers in this field, so the prices uh, are quite quite high. And uh, regarding the solar field, perhaps the share is similar to this one. You can see that the bigger part probably corresponds to the structures, mirrors, and uh, tubes make up about 25% uh, of uh, the total cost of the solar field. Then we have the foundations and land preparation, installation costs, uh, thermal oil, thermal oil is expensive, 4% in this case, 
etc. Uh, for example, for a CSP plant in Spain, it's 50 megawatt CSP, CSP plant in Spain with parabolic troughs. Uh, the price, the price including the EPC contract, can be in the range of the 200, uh, 200 million euro, uh, between 200 million and 230 million euro probably. Regarding the electricity cost, that is probably the, the most interesting number. It depends on different factors like the solar resource, the capacity of the thermal storage system, the labor costs, financial, etc. I would say that uh, nowadays in Spain the cost, the levelized cost of uh, electricity is uh, in the range of, uh, it's less for sure than 250 euro per megawatt hour, that's uh, 25 euro cent per kilowatt hour. Uh, but it's probably lower, perhaps in the range of uh, 20, 20 or well, 200 euro per megawatt hour. It's diff difficult to say because there is not much information going out of the companies that operate the plants. And in the southwest uh, USA, with a better solar resource, um, well, a much better solar resource, I would say, and uh, operating experience and so on, the cost, according to some reports, can be in the range of the 12, uh, sorry, this is an error, 12 dollar cents per kilowatt hour. That's, uh, it would be 120 dollars per megawatt hour. Uh, as I said, it's difficult to say if these numbers are right or not. It's difficult also to say if uh, these figures are going to decrease in the future. We hope so, with uh, the different improvements that uh, are being made to the technology. But, uh, but well, there's a long way until until uh, this technology can get a grid parity with uh, competing technologies like uh, conventional thermal power plants or even uh, wind power and so on. There are some differential advantages of this technology, so we'll, well, they're related mainly with uh, dispatchability. We will comment on that on the next session. But uh, well, as I said, there's a lot of work to be done in the future. And uh, well, uh, just to conclude, uh, I would say that uh, this technology is a mature technology commercially proven, with uh, more than 500 megawatts already operating in the world, and an extensive operational record, that of the sex plants, which has been have been operating some of them since uh, 1986, some of the last one of them since 1991, so more than 20 years. They were, they were easy to finance. They are not currently easy to finance in Spain, because uh, probably all of you know uh, there's a important crisis going on in the financial system and general the Spanish economy. Economy, and uh, well, it's at the moment the state of the art in CSP, in concentrated solar power and solar thermal power. There are some disadvantages of the, of this technology. Few manufacturers of key elements I already mentioned is one of the of the cons of this technology because there is a limited competence. Uh, the limited maximum temperature due to the also limited concentration ratio, which is uh, achievable, leads to a limited efficiency. I would say that the efficiency uh, of these plants is already close to. To their, to their technical limit without uh, big improvements. And uh, at the moment, they use uh, costly heat transfer fluid with also some environmental uh, negative aspects. And something that we will talk about in next session, uh, we have limited thermal storage options, as we will see. And being dispatchability a key factor for the success of solar thermal power, 
uh, <coughs> thermal energy storage is uh, also a key factor. Well, and uh, this is all. Here you can. I have uh, included some links to to web uh, sites or web pages or documents uh, where you can find some more information. Especially the first one, the Trafnet, uh, well, is a very good source of information, updated information, and uh, some some things more. Well, this is all. Thank you very much. If uh, well, I don't know how we will organize with the questions, Fernando, but uh, what well, I'm I'm ready for your questions. Thank you to all of you for listening to me. Okay, thank you very much, Manuel. Uh, your presentation was uh, impressive, uh, both for um, pedagogic reasons and also for uh, in-depth view on technical and economic uh, assessment. So, congratulations! This is a, a very worth uh, session for for all of us. So, we are going to try very smoothly to proceed to. Uh, Q and A session. So let me change the configuration of the of the room, and we are going to to go ahead with some questions. So um, let me check. So there is um, well, there is a first question on uh, reliable data for direct normal irradiation. So I think we will have a dedicated session on this. That's right, Manuel. Yes, uh, we will have a dedicated oh. session to to the estimation, well, to the assessment of uh, the solar resource. Uh, Anyway, I don't know if you wish uh, I can answer to the question. I don't know if uh, that's... Okay, very well. Okay, thank you. So, we go for uh, other questions. So, about the costs, um, what could be the expected cost of CSP electricity in the MENA region? Thank you. In the mineral region, I would say uh, I would say that the expected cost would would be close to the or similar would be similar to the cost of uh, electricity in, in the southwest southwest states of uh, North America because uh, they have a very good solar resource too. This is the main factor by far. If you have a a high uh, DNI, direct normal irradiance, or irradiation, or insulation, uh, different words for the same uh, thing. If you have a high DNI, um, mm, the the cost of electricity would be will be for sure lower than if you have a not so good DNI, like is the case in Spain. In Spain, we have a good DNI in the range of 200 of 2000 uh, kilowatt hours per square meter in the south of Spain, a little bit more, a little bit less. But uh, in the United States or in North of Africa, you can have up to 20% more, probably. And uh, well, that makes a big difference. It's not only the amount of uh, DNI, it's also the fact that uh, you have much or many more many more completely sunny day, completely clear days, which make uh, operation more, it makes it easier and um, more efficient. So finally that uh, leads to a lower uh, electricity cost. I would say that you can could expect a cost similar to, well, in the range of, uh, yes, of 10, 20 cents, um, cents of a uh, euro, euro cents, uh, 10 or 12, sorry, for per kilowatt hour in the in the near future, and uh, probably lower uh, in the midterm. Okay, great. Thank you very much, uh, Manuel. So we can go 
with uh, another question. Um, well, basically, what is the minimum size uh, for these CSP plants? Uh, well, we are talking today of a parabolic trough. So, what would be the minimum size of parabolic trough power plant to be profitable? Thank you. Well, um, if you, uh, I assume that you are asking about electricity generation. Um, with the technology, with the present technology, with the state of the art, there are some analyses that uh, conclude that the optimum size of these plants would be in the range of the 80 megawatts, 80 perhaps uh, 100 megawatts, in that range. Uh, uh, on the other, well, that uh, would be probably, or well, this is the optimum. If you go to the minimum size to be profitable, of course, depends on the conditions. For example, in Spain, the 50 megawatt plants are profitable, despite of not being the optimum size. But there is a limitation by the regulation. And on the other hand, there's also a support, uh, support mechanism for these types of plants that make these relatively small plants profitable. So it depends a lot of, uh, on the conditions. Uh, the question of the profitability is difficult to say. From a technical point of view, you can build uh, you can build uh, parabolic trough plants of uh, plant of one megawatt. For example, there is one operating in Arizona, if I'm not wrong. I don't remember exactly the name. Uh, it was installed. It was erected by I think by Solargenics, American company, and it's one. Uh, one megawatt plant operating with an organic crank iron cycle. Uh, they are very proud, as far as I know, they are very proud of uh, of it and it operates efficiently. I don't know if it's, it's uh, also profitable. I don't know if that answers the question, but uh, it's difficult to to give uh, to be more concrete in this case. Okay, great. So yes, I think that's um, it. All depends on. Uh, how the electric electric power is remunerated and apart from this it seems that the optimal size for these plants is uh, somewhere between 100 and 200 megawatts is that right uh, Manuel? Uh, perhaps a little bit less perhaps okay. a little bit less for this type of plants okay perhaps in the range of 80 100 okay 80 megawatt 100 megawatt perfect thank you there are, there mm -hmm. Yes, there are different uh, studies, different analyses, but um, I would say that more, most of them uh, conclude that uh, for this technology, this would be the optimum size. The problem is that you, if you make a very large power plant, you need an enormous uh, solar field with, uh, with many kilometers of tubes and pipelines and so on. And, uh, for it becomes quite difficult to manage efficiently such a large dimensions. Okay, great. So another classical question: How much water is needed for cooling? Mm -hmm. Does this uh, become yes. a problem in MENA region? So I think it deserves to be uh, clarified and to explain that um, dry cooling is also possible with uh, well yes. uh, lowering of efficiency. So. Manuel, you are the expert. The floor is yours. <laughs> well, uh, yes, this is a classical question, especially in Spain, but uh, also, of course, it's a, it's a great concern uh, regarding the projects in the MENA region. A uh, probably trough plant uh, is a solar, solar power plant that uses, uh, <coughs> uses a thermal engine, a steam turbine. The, con the condenser of the steam turbine needs to be cooled like in any other uh, <coughs> thermal power plant, uh, be it uh, nuclear or, or gas or whatever. And uh, that, uh, to do this cooling efficiently, uh, requires water, requires uh, water consumption or water, the use of water. If you have a large reservoir, you use that uh, reservoir for for cooling. If you don't, 
but you still have water, you use uh, cooling towers. Normally, it's more efficient. With cooling towers, that is the conventional solution. Uh, well, conventional with all the <laughs> with all the limits. I would say there's nothing really conventional in this technology yet. But uh, well, uh, cooling tower is the most uh, ex the most uh, normal, the most common solution. Uh, with cooling tower in Spain, uh, the water consumption, the water use would be about uh, four, four to between four and five liters per kilowatt hour of electricity generated. That means that for a 50 megawatt power plant without thermal storage, you generate roughly 100, uh, 100 gigawatt hours. You need 500,000 cubic meters of water per year. That's a large amount of water, similar to other thermal thermal power plants. Uh, but uh, anyway, it's a large amount of water. Of course, in the mineral region, water is a serious serious uh, problem. Water is scarce everywhere, but uh, even more in these uh, countries. And uh, the solution is to use dry cooling or a very efficient or very efficient uh, cooling techniques. Uh, there are a lot of work going on. There's a lot of work going on this uh, on this subject. Uh, but uh, at the moment, the preferred option is dry cooling. With dry cooling, you have a you have greater, uh, you have higher um, parasitics or high, higher electricity consumption of the plant, and on the other hand, the power block is less efficient, so that uh, leads to a higher electricity cost. Uh, so there's a, it's a matter of a trade-off between between water consumption and the electricity price or electricity cost. Very well. Thank you, Manuel. Next question. What is the cost of operation and maintenance of this type of plant? Well, as I said, it's uh, difficult to say. But, uh, but I can give you a number because, uh, because I heard it recently at a conference. And uh, this uh, figure was given by one operator of plant. They say that the operation maintenance cost is in the range of uh, two and a half, uh, 2.5 euro cents, 2.5 euro cents per kilowatt hour of electricity generated. That's uh, probably that's a figure that you can find uh, in other places too. It's uh, it seems quite uh, quite reasonable. Okay, great. So, um, well, it's now one hour and a half. We start the webinar. I'm afraid we have to adjourn uh, very soon. Manuel, uh, do you still have time for one or two additional questions? Yes, no problem. Okay. If you wish. Okay, very well. Thank you. So we will we will go ahead for one, two more questions. And unfortunately, we cannot cope with uh, uh, all of them. Um, there is another question about uh, direct steam generation. I think you already mentioned uh, the fact that there is a pilot plant uh, using uh, water steam generation directly in in Spain for three megawatts. Is there any other experiences or um, expectations for the near future? Thank you. Well, uh, direct steam generation well, is uh, quite promising. It uh, simplifies uh, the, the configuration of the plant because you eliminate heat exchangers. And uh, on the other hand, you use a less expensive uh, uh, fluid, like uh, is water, and uh, with uh, no problem, with no environmental problem, or, or yes, no environmental problems. So uh, it's very very attractive. There are studies that uh, that say that uh, with direct steam generation, the cost of electricity would, would be reduced reduced in approximately uh, seventeen percent. Regard respect with respect to the present technology with the oil 
uh, thermal oil as uh, heat transfer fluid. Uh, as far as I know, the this pilot plant in in central in central Spain is the only the only project of a significant size. I don't know of any other project of a significant size in in the world with direct steam generation. Uh, I have to say that uh, there are alternatives for direct steam generation. For example, you can generate steam directly in a central receiver system in a tower, probably at a higher temperature. So, uh, well, it's not clear whether this would be will be the technology of the future, but of course, it's uh, probably the next step for parabolic traps. Okay, good. So thank you very much, Manuel. We adjourn now uh, the session. So uh, thank you very much, uh, all of you, uh, who attend this uh, session. We see you again in the next uh, lesson three. So upcoming in some weeks. So thank you very much, uh, Manuel, if you want to adjourn. Well, yes. Uh, well, thank you to all of you by, <laughs> for listening to me. Excuse uh, me sometimes with the, the English or with the operation of the <laughs> of the pointer and so on. But I hope uh, you the presentation was clear enough. And if you need any other information, you can contact me. And as far as I can, I will try to to answer you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.